what are we all blessed with? What are our gifts? And even if you think you have a gift for something, but you're not quite sure, you should check it out because maybe you do. And that's something worthwhile and worthy and might be affecting and touching somebody else. So go for it. We all have those moments where we need a little encouragement to get through our day. Someone to remind us that we are not alone. Find peace. Embrace joy. Seek God daily. Welcome to Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. Our guests are actor and producer Rita Wilson, and in a bonus interview, the queen of bluegrass music, Rhonda Vincent. First up, we talk with actor, producer, and singer-songwriter Rita Wilson. Rita has a long list of credits to her name, including many roles in television and film, and as the producer of such blockbuster films as My Big Fat Greek Wedding and Mamma Mia. Rita also shines as a singer-songwriter and has just released her fourth album called Halfway to Home. Rita tells us about growing up as a small-town kid in the bright lights of Hollywood and how it's never too late to chase a dream, plus how her faith has strengthened her all throughout her life. I'm Rita Wilson. I am a singer, a songwriter, an actor, and a producer. I was born and raised in Hollywood, California, and um, my parents, my dad was Bulgarian and my mom was Greek, and they met in New York and um, moved to California after they got married. I'm a first-generation American, and growing up in Hollywood, it was just like my little hometown, but I grew up with really solid family values because my parents were just extraordinary people. And so um, my dad converted to Greek Orthodoxy, and um, then Tom, who was baptized Catholic, converted to Greek Orthodoxy, uh, and both of my kids are Greek Orthodox. For us, it was really kind of great um, going to church on Sundays. Um, Easter is a huge holiday for us, um, Christmas as well, but Easter is really the big, big holiday in um, Greek Orthodoxy. But yes, I'm a firm believer in rituals and traditions, and uh, we did all of that growing up. And I really have to thank my mom, but I also have to thank my dad for, for uh, doing it too, because, you know, a lot of times you see the moms going and the dads are kind of like, yeah, I'll catch up with you next week. But my dad would come and uh, feel very blessed by that. And he was very much embraced by the Greek community, had a bunch of friends at church and golfing buddies. <laughs> and even though I grew up in this big town that is iconic and people come from all over the world to sort of visit, I just grew up like a normal kid. We rode our bikes and we climbed the hills and went to the movies and except the movie theaters were on Hollywood Boulevard or you would get ice cream and that was on Hollywood Boulevard. But my parents instilled in us really great family values and my parents were married 59 years and I think um, you can grow up in a big city and it doesn't mean that you have to abandon who you are as a person and who, how, who you are by the nature of how you were raised. So I really have my parents to thank for that. And music was always playing in the background, whether it was in the car or on the radio at home, but it was AM radio, so it was just one station. But that one station played everything. It played country, it played pop, it played soul, R&B, rock, everything. So that's how I was exposed to all this great country music and, and all sorts of genres. And my mom was very funny because we'd be driving in the car and she would hear a song on the radio and in her Greek accent, she would say, that song going to be a hit. And she was always right. So in some weird way, I think I started listening to music in a way, a way and identifying like, why did my mom say that was going to be a hit? And it was, what did that song have in it that other songs didn't have? So, um, that was kind of cool, this like Greek lady saying, that's not going to be a hit. I 
didn't know I wanted to become an actress. I was discovered my first day of high school when I was 14 years old, and that led to a modeling job for Harper's Bazaar. And then that modeling job led to an agency. And then I got my Screen Actors Guild card by doing a part on The Brady Bunch. And that led to acting. And I felt very thankful because it was just a great job. And I kept working, but I didn't have the idea that I could be an actor until it almost was telling me like, you are working so much that I think this is your job. <laughs> and so um, that's how I ended up getting into the business. But uh, what I have memories of wanting to do is be a singer. But because the acting thing took so much time and a lot of precedence, and then you become very ensconced in that, back then it was sort of looked down upon if you try to do two things, like, oh, I'm gonna be an actor and I'm gonna be a singer. So um, I feel really lucky and really blessed that I get to be doing music now, writing and singing. I always wanted to be a musician, I think, uh, in my heart of hearts, but a lot of it is you're scared and you don't want it. You kind of think of it as, as a thing that maybe happened in the past, but for me, it didn't happen. I didn't play an instrument, I didn't read music. And then I met a woman who changed my life in many ways, Cara Diaguardi, an incredible songwriter and a producer. And she said to me, well, what kind of things do you want to do? And I said, oh boy, I would give anything if I could write a song like you. And she said, well, what makes you think that you can't? And I said, because I don't play an instrument and I don't read music. And she said, I don't either. Do you have something you want to say? And when she said that, I was like, do I have something I want to say? I have so much that I want to say. And it had almost been like bursting, wanting to get out. And I didn't have an outlet for it. I feel acting in a way is like you have a character and you're playing somebody else. And then you do that performance and you go and it's out of your hands. And other people, editors take care of it. And, you know, your performance is formed afterwards in a way. But writing music to me is a really intensely personal connection. And I am so thankful for it because, you know, when you're writing a song, you're really writing your, if it's not your own personal experience, it's uh, an idea or a theme that you want to explore with your co-writers, for example. But it is still a personal story that you're telling. And I love that. And for me, music is, I, I've always been attracted to the story in songs. So that is what I'm always looking for. Like, is this a good story? Am I going to, you know, be drawn in by what this song is? And even like growing up and hearing songs like Ode to Billy Joe, what was happening up on that bridge? Or She's Leaving Home by the Beatles. Why is she going with that man from the motor trade? Like, don't go. Stay. What about your parents? They're going to miss you. So it was always about the stories that engaged me. So I feel in a way like I'm a storyteller. So my new album is called Halfway to Home, and it's really based on sort of the feeling that I always have that we're, in, we're kind of works in progress. We're not really finished. And we are constantly trying to be better. And just when you think you have something figured out, something comes from this side and says, oh, well, I'm going to give you this new challenge. And here's what you can do about that. So um, I feel that sometimes you're kind of one step forward, two steps back. But at the same time, um, I wouldn't have it any other way because if we're lucky enough to be alive, we're lucky enough to be a work in progress. The song The Spark was written um, really about anybody who's in a long-term relationship. And you can define what long-term is for yourself, but I feel that when you get married, what's that thing that happens? You have like a connection with somebody. You have this electrical thing and you have this chemistry and you have a spark and that's what lights the flame. And I think in any long-term relationship, you're gonna have your ups and downs 
and sometimes there's gonna be big flames happening and it's all awesome. But sometimes those flames can like get a little dim and there's like little embers and you have to blow on them to get them going up again. But it's kind of about if you keep that little spark lit, there's always a way to bring back that fire. Throw Me a Party is the single off my album, Halfway to Home. And it was inspired by the fact that um, four years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I'm a survivor. And um, when you first hear those words, you have cancer, it's pretty terrifying. And um, I'm not alone in that, it was scary. And so before you really know that you're gonna be okay and you're dealing with all the bad news, I said to my husband, look, if something happens and I should go before you, I want you to be very sad for a very long time. <laughs> but I also want to have a big party. And I described everything that I wanted. I wanted a party and I wanted sparklers and I wanted food and I wanted my friends and I wanted everybody to sing and dance and tell stories and laugh. And um, thankfully, that's not going to happen for uh, the long future. But um, I had the title, Throw Me, to Par Throw Me a Party. And so I had a little writing camp with a bunch of songwriters, and Cara Diagordi was there. And um, I came to, everybody was broken up into little groups, and uh, the group that wrote Throw Me a Party was Christian Bush and Liz Rose, two incredible songwriters, and me. And we wrote the song about how you want to be remembered. I realize that so many people are having that same experience or have thought about what it is that they want to do when it's their time. And I have gotten the most beautiful comments on um, social media about people who have used the song for memorials, used the song uh, at their funerals, have said, this is the song that I want because I do think people ultimately want to be celebrated for their lives and everybody wants to be, you know, remembered and, and missed. But at the end of the day, you want to be remembered for making someone's life better. My faith has evolved as I've gotten older because for one thing, it's different. It's, it's not the same as when you're younger because the things that you think you want when you're younger are very different. And having um, just been blessed with really an extraordinary life, you almost become more thankful. You can't take credit for it in a way. I, I, I feel like um, everything that I do, anything that good, good that is coming out of it, I, I believe is from, um, a higher power and the older I've gotten I, I think it's about much more of a, tr a trust and much more of a faith that things are going to be okay who by worrying could add one hour to their life and that has given me a lot of peace because you can spiral into the craziest sort of thoughts and when you let go of that piece of it, it's very, um, very helpful. I'm a big believer in prayer. Well, it's the way I start my day. So I don't get out of bed without saying a prayer of gratitude. It's funny because it's like, I, I, one day I was like, are you getting bored hearing all this? Because it's like, I'm thankful for this and I'm thankful for that. And I just go through my list and I pray for the people that are, you know, struggling or need a, a little bit of extra support. And, um, but I really do start my day with a prayer of gratitude. And um, I, I, I'm i saying prayers throughout the day. I think everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people do that. And um, so for me, it's just a part of my day, really. So um, the first copy of Jesus Calling was a gift to me by my friend Faith Hill and it was the leather bound one, I still have it. And then I think I told Kristen Chenoweth about it, so she now has it. And it's so funny because sometimes during, now that we have the app, the app is great too, because it's with you everywhere. Um, but now that there's the app, I will send quotes back and forth to my friend. If you'd like, have you read Jesus Calling today? How about this quote? Because there's always, it's like, 
kind of, I don't know, crazy that sometimes you'll read, uh, you know, the passage from the day and it's exactly what you need to hear that day. I don't know. That is crazy. And I love on the app that you can mark your favorites and that's very helpful. <laughs> what I love about the book is that it's a uh, devotional, like, there are so many different devotionals, meditative devotionals, um, you know, spiritual devotionals. But for me, what I love about it is that uh, Sarah Young, the writer, has basically taken her own sort of meditations on scripture and made them into um, a way that feels very accessible and very um, manageable. So that it's, it's personal in a way and it makes it feel more connected than just reading scripture. This is from March 23rd. I am a God of both intricate detail and overflowing abundance. When you entrust the details of your life to me, you are surprised by how thoroughly I answer your petitions. I take pleasure in hearing your prayers, so feel free to bring me all your requests. The more you pray, the more answers you will receive. Best of all, your faith is strengthened as you see how precisely I respond to your specific prayers. Because I am infinite in all my ways, you need not fear that I will run out of resources. Abundance is at the very heart of who I am. Come to me in joyful expectation of receiving all you need, and sometimes much more. I delight in showering blessings on my beloved children. Come to me with open hands and heart ready to receive all I have for you. So good. I like the um, psalm that goes along with this too. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor will I satisfy with food. I, I think there's a myth that things just happen easily for you. Oh, if you wanna do this, you make this happen. If you want that, that happens. But I think anybody who has worked really hard at something knows. It takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of vision, and it takes a lot of discipline and consistency, right? And for me, I, I think that's one of the things that is the most important, is not to give up, to believe that you can do something. I think if you're doing things for the right reasons, if they're really truthfully something you things that you want to do it's slightly easier to make it happen and i do believe that you can set goals and 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 make them happen but before you do that you have to know what it is that you want earlier i, I talked a little bit about um everybody sort of having a gift and since i've been doing music and i meet people and i sign cds and i get to talk to people a little bit I realize and I hear a lot that people say something like, oh, it's so great that you're writing and doing music now. And, oh, I've always wanted to dot, dot, dot. And they always have a thing or a dream that they always wanted to do. And I always say, it's not too late to do that dream. And you don't know where that will lead you. Like, even if it's something like taking a painting class or drawing or sewing or cooking or, whatever it is, drama, comedy, there's always a place that you can find to start pursuing that creatively. And I think that that is a really important thing that people know, that they're never just stuck. It's never too late to follow your dreams. And a really, really good friend of mine had this amazing quote when I started writing music. And I said, what, what makes me think that I can be writing music now? He's a very successful singer songwriter you've been doing it all your life. And he said, because creativity is time independent. And I was like, okay, yes, there are no rules. Do what you love. You can find Rita's album, Halfway to Home, at your favorite music retailer or streaming provider. We'll be right back with our next guest, bluegrass sensation, singer Rhonda Vincent, after this brief message about the Jesus Calling weekly prayer call. Did you know that Sarah Young, the author of Jesus Calling, prays for her readers each day? In that spirit, we want to extend the Jesus Calling prayer community out to you in a more personal way. 
Each Tuesday morning, you can dial into the Jesus Calling Weekly Prayer Call, where the team from Jesus Calling and special guests will minister to us during a 10-minute call to reflect on that day's passage from Jesus Calling, read scripture references, and pray together for each other and our world. Prayer call times are 8 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Central, 6 a.m. Mountain, and 5 a.m. Pacific, and are for U.S. only. For more information on the Jesus Calling weekly prayer call or to submit prayer requests, please visit jesuscalling.com slash prayer dash call. From the time she was little, Rhonda Vincent had a few constants in her life, family, music, and faith. Today, the talented bluegrass singer, songwriter, and musician tells us about growing up in her very musical family, along with some of the blessings and miracles God's given her along the way. Well, I'm Rhonda Vincent, and I'm from Greentop, Missouri, and I have the, the blessing of singing and playing the music I love, bluegrass music, country, and gospel music, and traveling all over the world. Green Top, you might say, where is Green Top, Missouri? It's at the very top of Missouri, in the heart of America. There isn't any interstate or mall within at least 100 miles of there. And we were, Kirksville, where I live now, was the, that was the city where they had a prototype for the Super Walmart that was open 24 hours, because they figured if it could make it in Kirksville, Missouri, it would work anywhere. Music is traced back five generations in the Vincent family. And I started singing when I was three, um, made our first recording. The first documentation was when I was five years old. And I will, and even now, my daughter's carrying on the tradition. So this is six generations now. On my sixth birthday, my dad got a snare drum, a stand, and a set of brushes. And I became the, the drummer for the Sally Mountain Show, which was made up of my grandpa Bill, um, Uncle Pearl, Aunt Catherine, cousins Joe and Ricky, mom and dad at my grandparents' house, which was just one house away. There was a music party there every night. And people say, oh, you're exaggerating. No, it was, they love music so much uh, that friends came over every night. So it was just a, a constant life of music, you know, whether it was after school, just dad and I, or grandpa and I, or a music party every night. A very, very concentrated um, life of music. The reason, I think, now that I look back, they had this love for the music. But when I was two, my father had a car wreck, broke his neck, not expected to live. They let him actually lay in the hospital. They didn't even clean him up for a week. He laid in glass. And, you know, just, just from the wreck, they basically laid him there because, you know, this was, what was that, 1964. They took a, a piece out of his hip, fused his neck together. We saw an x-ray at one time, and it looked like they had bread wrappers. I mean, to the day he died, two places on his neck looked like they had just taken a bread wrapper tie that was holding his necks together. But they fused it together. Um, he said, Lord, if you'll just give me one good leg, I'll drag the other one. And do you know that's exactly what happened? He ended up walking with a cane and, and every, hit the toe of his right boot. He would drag his right leg and it was com always completely worn out. But you know, his faith is what brought him through that. And, and the, so he couldn't run after us. So he kept us within arm's length. And that's why I think he picked me up from school, playing, have dinner, friends came over. He always knew where we were and, and you know, he couldn't run after us. So I think that's when music came, became an even more, a, a, a larger focus for him. We were always in church. We lived like a block away from the church. My great grandmother, Ethel Souter, she always had her Bible. She was marked up, it was frayed, it was, she read her Bible every day. So when you come in and you see that, uh, was a wonderful influence and you know always I guess keeping you on the right path but but also teaching you and always seeing that and I have seen so many blessings miracles that God has given us um, for example 2005 I have a, had a life-threatening illness we were on tour and every hospital I would go to when they don't know you they think you're just trying to get pain pills or something I was in a tremendous amount of pain I finally from Denver to Nashville to I mean, Ohio, all through um, five different hospitals. I finally said, take me home. I had E. coli, which had, had uh, destroyed seven inches of my large intestine that had to be uh, re removed by surgery. When I came home, 
He brought me, God brought me through all of that. I really sincerely thought I was gonna die. The pain was so intense on that last trip home. We were several, um, many hours away from home. And on that last trip, I had, had already resorted to the fact that I was, was probably gonna die. The pain was, was unbearable. And I got out of the hospital. Not only did God bring me through that, but when I got out of the hospital in, in Kirksville, Missouri, Dolly Parton was standing in my living room. And she said, I had to come make sure you were okay myself. That's, I mean, she's such a special lady. And that's just another one of the incredible blessings. You know, the, we've been uh, uh, blessed with opportunity. I could not even dream. I would never think, number one, that I would get to meet Dolly Parton let alone to come home from the hospital. And there she is. I mean, I was just moved to tears that she would take the time to, to travel 500 plus miles from Nashville to Kirksville, Missouri. She even went by the, the Green Top Missouri sign and got a picture. We were driving up to see my dad because he, he didn't make it down there. And we go to Green Top and she goes, pull the car over, pull the car over. And she got out right by the Green Top sign, held her hand up uh, and took a picture and people, as they're driving by, are starting, they're calling around saying, I think I just saw Dolly in Green Top, Missouri. And people are going, no way, Dolly wouldn't be here. She wouldn't be in Green Top, Missouri, but she actually, she was there and uh, she made quite a stir. She made the paper too, by the way, with her, with her picture and the Green Top sign. But a special lady and, and just another way, I guess, that you just see so many miracles uh, in our life and opportunities and just, um, always keeping that faith, I guess, and, and I think there's a, you have to seek Him. After someone gave Rhonda a copy of Jesus Calling, she found a new way to seek God in peace and stillness. To encourage others on their walk, she reads the April 20th entry of Jesus Calling. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Hear me saying, peace, be still to your restless heart. No matter what happens, I will never leave you or forsake you. Let this assurance soak into your mind and heart until you overflow with joy. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, you need not fear. The media relentlessly proclaim bad news for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. A steady diet of their fare will sicken you. Instead of focusing on fickle, ever-changing news broadcasts, tune in to the living word the one who is always the same. Let scripture saturate your mind and heart and you will walk steadily along the path of life. Even though you don't know what will happen tomorrow, you can be absolutely sure of your ultimate destination. I hold you by your right hand and afterward, I will take you into glory. I am so thankful that I do have that faith and I have God, I have the Bible to, you know, to guide us and, and as, a, you know, as a roadmap of life. Well, we have, it's a new project. It was filmed and recorded live at the Ryman Auditorium, live at the Ryman with Bluegrass Legends. I've never done a project like this or, or that, to this degree, um, just so many elements of this project. But it was with Bluegrass Legends, people that are dear friends that I grew up listening to, who are your, you know, they are pioneers in bluegrass music. So to have them come and get to, to share an evening with them at the Ryman, that was special in, within itself. And so we decided to film and record it, and it is, it's just everything that I had hoped it to be. I get to sing with the Osborne Brothers. They are the group that my family tried to emulate. We, they are the greatest influence on my music and on my family's music. So to call them friends, is, it's still, I have to pinch myself. It's like, oh my goodness, Bobby will send me a note and say, how's my little all-American bluegrass girl? It's like, oh, melts my heart. That's one of my favorite things about the music business is different genres. Um, I mean, from Alan Jackson saying on several of his songs, where I, the song where I come from, there's cornbread and chicken. Keith Urban uh, sang The Water is White on one of my projects. Um, Alison Krauss, she and I grew up together. Um, um, there's, there's so many, Martina McBride, Faith Hill. Uh, the rec most recently, we are blessed with a number one song. It's part of the Elton John, Bernie Taupin. Um, it's a collaboration, it's a tribute CD for commemorating their 50 years of, the, of musical collaborations. So, and it's a, a duet with Dolly. So you just never know where God is gonna lead you in that path and the person that you're going to, you know, who would think that we would be friends with Bernie Toppin? 
And then to get, I got a beautiful letter from Elton John, a gold embossed um, letter from him. So I love the connections that, that music brings. And a lot of the time, it, it's not where you would expect it. You know, Bernie Taupin being, writing all these songs with Elton John, who knew he was a bluegrass fan? And he loves bluegrass music and has come to our shows. He usually, always, if he's close by, he'll be at our show and, and has become a dear friend. We meet everyone after every show, so it's like an experience, like you hear the show, we get to talk to you afterwards. Many are friends, they stay in touch. Now with social media, we stay in touch well beyond the show. And it amazes me the, the way people now, they'll say, oh, I heard this song, it, you know, I'm, we played, we have a song called His Promised Land and that I wrote, it's a acapella gospel song. And so many times they said, we were playing this as my father passed, we were playing this song. I'm just a kid from Greentop, Missouri. I'm just out here playing music that I like. I did not realize the responsibility. There becomes a, a responsibility and expectation to make sure, number one, that you are representing yourself, that are we, you know, how does God perceive me? Am I perceiving this in, in a good way? Would he be proud of me for, for doing this? And knowing that the songs that you're doing are influencing people, like um, to have this guy say, I was, I literally had the gun to my head and your song came on and I put the gun down. I mean, that's really powerful to know that, I, I, I mean, obviously I had nothing to do with that. That had to be God interceding in that because that guy, I've known him now for years and he still stays in touch. Uh, in fact, I bought him a car once. He couldn't, didn't, couldn't get to the show and he got somebody to bring him there and I said, hey, I said, told the guys, I said, let's go out and buy him a car today. And so when he came to the show, I brought him on stage and presented him with a new car, or a used car. But uh, it's, I, I love that we are so blessed that we get to share that blessing with so many, whether it's in a song or whatever, in whatever respect it is. To hear more of Rhonda's music and to find out about her latest projects and shows, please visit her website at rondavincent.com. next time on Jesus Calling Stories of Faith will feature a special story about The Next Door, a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving women in crisis and equipping them for lives of wholeness and hope. We'll talk to some of the women who have come through their program and how growing their faith has factored into their recovery and reentry into a life after incarceration. So coming through the next door, I learned a lot of ways to cope and handle situations. At first, when my brother passed, I almost immediately went right back to drinking and drugging because that's the only thing that made me feel no feelings. But once I walked through the process of the next door and I was able to process his death a little more day by day and to gain a relationship with God and understand why God does things even though they may hurt us, he does things for the greater. Thank you for watching Jesus Calling Stories of Faith. To learn more about how to keep up with our shows bi-monthly and to listen to our weekly podcast, please visit youtube.com slash Jesus Calling Book to view and hear previous episodes and to watch a short informational video about how to access all things Jesus Calling on audio and video formats. Plus, learn how to subscribe to our podcast and video channels. Your subscription helps get the word out to more people who will benefit from these inspirational stories of faith.